Welcome everybody. Thanks for ASAP to facilitate this event and uh, I'm going to go straight to the core of things. Dr. Hanschiari was not a surgeon, was not a uh, neurologist, he was actually a an anatomopathologist, so he was performing autopsies on people. So the first description about Chiari one malformation was in 1891. It was a 17-year-old woman who did not have, in retrospect, Chiari one malformation, but was having hydrocephalus, and the hydrocephalus was pushing the tonsils outside of the border of the skull. So the ironic part of all this is that the first case of Chiari was not a Chiari one malformation after all, with a new classification. And he describes the uh, elongation of the tonsils, which is peg-like, with a picture which is very similar to something like this. The only difference between the Chiari malformation that you have grown to know and that was that the driving force for the herniation was not the small posterior fossa, something we are going to keep hearing tonight over and over, but the fact that the elevated amount of uh, fluid content inside the uh, ventricles from the outside was pushing the brain outside the limit of the skull. The first paper which, which, uh, with which he described these malformations, which was changes of the cerebellum, is a result of hydrocephalus of the cerebrum. So it was not, again, Chiari-1 malformation the way we know now. It was a tonsillar herniation. And he, on the grounds of what he found on autopsies, he made arbitrarily a classification in four forms. Again, this, this classification was based on criteria which are autopsy criteria. So in the first one, he noticed that there was just tonsillar herniation together with hydrocephalus. And in the second one, there was hydrocephalus, the tonsillar herniation, plus there was spina bifida with a myelomeningocele, which is Chiari 2 malformation. Chiari 3, there was uh, cerebellar herniation, not just the tonsils, but a big chunk of the cerebellum, coming out of a spina bifida, which was not in the lower part of the, lower, the lumbar spine, but was a hole in the back of the vertebrae in the neck. So this hole in the back of the vertebrae was sucking out a big chunk of the cerebellum through it. Chiari 4 was something that didn't even have a tonsillar herniation, so I, people are still scratching their head to ask why he called in you know, Chiari 4 at the end and was a picture like this in which the cerebellum is practically non-existent and it's coming down to a small peanut. Over the years, the classification has changed. So from an autopsy perspective, uh, then Chiari did, is, is a KA pathological appearance, we passed on a radiological, in a classification based on radiological features the, in the late 20th century, and then a classification based on the mechanisms driving, uh, causing the, the changes, and a classification based also on surgical criteria, which is what's happening during the course of the last years. The MRI made the biggest revolution since the time of Chiari and uh, caused the second reclassification. Uh, what the MRI did allowed us to have an early and an easy diagnosis. Before, there was not even a CAT scan before, uh, before the early, the mid-70s. So without the CAT scan, the only way that you could find, identify the Chiari was when the Chiari was given massive syringomyelia cavities, the patient was totally crippled, the doctors had run out of options, you were doing an exploratory surgery and voila, you were finding that. Uh, with the MRI, everything became much easier and uh, with that also an early diagnosis. So. Since it was becoming easier to diagnose the Chiari-1 malformation, it be, the perceived prevalence became higher. What is the prevalence? The prevalence is how many patients affected by Chiari-1 malformation are in a population of 100,000 people. Uh, now, so the more people we were diagnosed with Chiari, the more the prevalence became higher, and Chiari stopped being a uh, rare disease back in the mid-80s. Rare disease is when you have 5,000 people out of 100,000 people who have, uh, were affected by this. Right now, uh, there are probably 2 million people affected by Chiari-1 malformation uh, recognized in the United States alone. This has caused an inversion of tendency. Before the advent of the MRI, the Chiari-2 malformation, the people with the spina bifida who walk with crutches or in the wheelchair, melomeningocele, etc., 
and also the tonsil herniation, where the number one in the list in the list of the Chiaris in terms of frequency and prevalence. Uh, with the introduction of prenatal vitamins, prenatal, you know, uh, prenatal ultrasound, uh, with the advention or advent of Roe versus Wade and uh, the, the application of abortion, Chiari tumor formation is only, uh, is only becoming a sort of a, an afterthought in the mind of doctors and patients in civilized countries. It still is the first form of carry in developing countries. So if you go in India, carry tumor formation is <coughs> 10 times, 15, 15, 20 times more frequent than carry one. Here, carry one wins by, wins by landslide. Because of the MRI, it became easy to see the, the carry one malformation. So all of a sudden, the radiologists were uh, facing a flood of people with some degree of tonsil herniation. So again, the tonsil herniation is when uh, the tonsils are passing through the hole, which is at the base of the skull, which is a hole exactly like this, approximately this size. So you are having people with three centimeter, two centimeter, one centimeter, one millimeter, a few millimeters. So at a certain point, the radiologist started saying, all right, uh, let's make it they make a unilateral decision. And somebody, and we still do not know who was the first guy who decided that, decided that five millimeter was the rule beyond which there was, you were calling Chiari a Chiari, and above which it was just a variant of normal. This rule was arbitrary, number one. And this rule was done from a radiological perspective. Then so again, Chiari was a pathologist. He did it from an autopsy perspective. The radiologist. Dr. XYZ, that we do not know who is, decided a five millimeter rule. This rule has important uh, repercussions right now because with that rule, it was decided that the, everything above four millimeters was just a variant of normal. And people were making, you know, they started having some studies showing, the, uh, showing this. So there was a variation of the position of the tonsil in regular people. Unfortunately, the people drawing these conclusions were their own people to draw that conclusion because they were the radiologists. The radiologists see a bunch of MRIs every day. And the only thing that they know about the patient is the fact that, OK, is over here that, uh, in, the, in the script that is in my hand that the patient is here because of his headache in the back of the head. And therefore, I'm assuming that in this case, the patient is a problem. Or, oh, wait a second, this patient is here because uh, he had a motor vehicle accident, has, doesn't have a headache in the back of the head, has other symptoms. Therefore, what we see here is not related to carry one malformation. What else they did not know was that in the vast majority of the people, carry one malformation is clinically silent for many years, and then you, you know, it raises its head later on in life. So the decision of five millimeter rule was in retrospect, a useful one to sort, you know, to separate the wheat from the chaff, but a dangerous one because kept a bunch of patients who were legitimate patients out in the cold. Very soon, people started seeing that the tonsil herniation was just a one part of a larger deal. And uh, people like Dr. Nishikawa, that, who spent many years at the Kiari Institute, and now he's back as a chairman of the University of Osaka, realized that there was something specific in many of the patients. And what the specific part was the size of the posterior fossa. So with this usual oriental patient, you can imagine, uh, back then there were no computers to calculate the volume. You were just going image after image on the MRI and calculating the volume of the posterior fossa of thousands and thousands of patients down to the cubic millimeter. So, what became evident was that uh, the, these patients were having, the carry malformation patients, were having a small posterior fossa which was squeezing the brain out. So there was a discrepancy between the size of the brain, which was normal, and the size of the skull, which was abnormal. But not the entire skull, just the skull in the back part. So it's like having a, you have, you have a foot which is a size eight and you stuff it in a shoe which is a size six. Uh, besides being uncomfortable, it also creates shifts. So you have the big toe coming out, you know, from a hole in the shoe if you have that. 
Dr. Nishikawa code, you first presented this issue of the volumetrically small posterior fossa, the small posterior fossa. And at that point, things started changing. So we saw that the tonsillar herniation was not, as initially thought, a abnormality of the, uh, of the brain, but it was actually an abnormality of the skull leading to a shifting of the brain, an otherwise normal brain. So uh, the Chiari-1 malformation was now identified for the first time as so-called a mesenchymal disorder. What's a mesenchymal? The mesenchyma is tissue that is present in developing stages of the fetus, which leads to the formation of many structures, including the bones. So the Chiari-1 malformation is a disorder from the grand-grand-grandfather of what ends up being the bone in the adult in the adult uh, individual. So it's a bone problem affecting the brain, which is the opposite of what the Chiari tumor formation, for example, is. The Chiari tumor formation sounds like a first cousin of the Chiari 1, because, you know, Chiari 1, Chiari 2. The reality is that they're not even remotely related. The only thing that they have in common is that they have the tonsillar herniation, which is an afterthought, which is an effect of an effect, but not the problem. In Chiari 1 malformation, is a bone disorder causing a brain, a central nervous system change of shift or change of shape and shifting around. In the Chiari 2 malformation, there is a change in the nervous system which is causing a change in the skeleton. So it couldn't be, you know, it is like really uh, the, the opposite of each other. So in 1999, on the grounds of all the things that they were getting all the evidence, MRI evidence, uh, that was getting uh, accumulated, my mentor, Dr. Mirat, started having the largest series of page carry patients at that point. With 366 patients, he had the largest population on carry ever described in history. So he started dealing with it, along with Dr. Kula and uh, all the residents were helping him, and I was among them. And a lot of observations started popping up. And this was the first time the Chiari was getting defined, not by a pathologist, not by a radiologist, by a neurosurgeon, was, you know, on the first time on the forefront of the battle. The guy meeting the patients, the guy seeing the MRI, seeing eventually the autopsies in some individuals, but also hearing the patients about uh, what they were complaining. So a number of things came out. The first one, the five millimeter rule was utterly nonsensical. So uh, there were patients with 25, 30 millimeters with zero symptoms, and some patients with three millimeters with the same symptoms and the same surgical positive response uh, that some people with the so-called five millimeter rule satisfied were having. Then the second thing was that we, a new definition of carry was given, which was having was on pathophysiologic grounds, which is the bone in the back of the posterior fossa is small, and that's a driving force for the carry bone malformation. That was the first time that that was put in term in the context of a patient population. Then, and this was the major evolution, from up to that point, the only symptom which was recognized, the only symptom of carry was the tossive headache, which is headache aggravated by coughing, straining, and uh, lifting stuff, something like that. And then if you were having any other symptom, the doctor simply were brushing you off. Dr. Mirat was the first time for the first person describing 85 symptoms of the syndrome, going from uh, brain to cardiovascular to genital urinary to uh, musculoskeletal, etc. So it was a much broader syndrome that was initially uh, um, it was initially thought. The natural history became another major uh, component of this 1999 article. Natural history was, okay, you do not have, not everybody who has Chiari develop a single ring myelia. Only 50% of the people with Chiari develop a sphinx. Number two, the majority of the people with Chiari 1 malformation develop symptoms between the ages of 25 and 45 with some subtypes inside. And yes, we have some children who develop, uh, who develop Chiari symptoms early, 
but those are a minority compared to all the others. And then we also have other patients go through the entire life with minimal or no symptoms whatsoever. So there is a clinical presentation which is more complex than what was initially perceived. But again, one of the major uh, contributions of that study was the fact that from the analysis of some of the families, we, uh, we realized that there were some pedigrees. So there was a genetic predisposition of some families to develop Chiari and to transmit it from one generation to the other. So a genetic study was started back in, the, in 1998 along with Duke University, which is still ongoing today. And that was the starting of the new modern era of Chiari. 